Well, good morning, everyone. How are you doing? <laughs> Caffeinated enough? You, you will need it for this talk. So, <laughs> so let's, uh, let's start a few words about me. Uh, it's, it's my favorite topic, so I'm going to spend about 20 minutes talking about me. Bear, bear with me, please. No, no, I'm just kidding. So um, I've been quite a while in the field of uh, information security and cybersecurity. Both as a, I started off as an academic researcher doing a PhD and some uh, academic papers on trust in wireless networks. But then I followed a professional career as a consultant. Um, I'm a consultant today as well. Uh, I've also been involved with OWASP since 2004. Done a lot of things, run the Greek chapter, uh, run a global AppSec conference 12 years ago and uh, helped in uh, lots of projects. I also like uh, teaching and training. I'm very passionate about training and teaching. This started off at the university when I was doing my PhD. I had to teach some students. They said that I was good at it, and uh, this developed into a passion about uh, teaching. Uh, so uh, there you go. This is me. And I'm um, also the advisory services director at uh, Census. Census is a boutique company based in Athens, Greece. We offer cybersecurity professional services. We are vendor agnostic, vendor independent. We don't resell anything. We just resell ourselves. And um, we focus a lot on what we call critical domains. So we do a lot of work in the automotive domain, with the, in the automotive industry. We do a lot of work with the medical devices, the medical industry, the healthcare industry and also with consumer electronics. And I'm saying that because uh, a lot of information in this talk, uh, a lot of uh, issues that we run into, a lot of problems, a lot of challenges, are based on the work we do at, uh, at Census. Now, when I was back at school, uh, I was very good at science, very good at maths, but I really sucked at history. My therapist says that this created trauma, which is expressed uh, in, in the following way. In every talk I give, I, I like to do a flashback. I like to go back in history and see what, what happened and what lessons we have learned. So again, bear with me, we're going to do a small flashback here. And we're going to go back to 2010. Um, Dennis Cruz is the guy that got me into OWASP. I owe him a lot. He's very passionate about application security. So back in 2010, I was a young professional at that time, and I watched the... Uh, a speech by Denise Cruz. I think the first time he delivered this uh, this talk was uh, here in Portugal in 2010. And uh, you know how Denise is. The talk was about 100 slides, uh, constant talking, very passionate. And among other things, Denise said that at some point your entire life depends on software and more and more these days on web applications. And then he went on saying that... Sorry. Um, in fact, we are becoming software. My mom's hearing aid and its advanced features. And was there any authentication there? Probably not at that time. And he went on saying that very soon we might have deaths in web AppSec. Of course, this was FUD. Uh, was trying to create, you know, um, to build awareness. And there was me, the young security professional, thinking, Okay, Denise is a good guy, but maybe he's exaggerating a bit here. And Denise ended up this uh, narrative by saying, how many people will have to die before we take application security seriously? And at that point, Costas, the young Costas was saying, okay, you're exaggerating. I mean, I know what you're trying to do here, but you're taking one step too far away. Let's see what happened next. So, actually, Denise was not exaggerating, because a couple of years back, in 2008, we had the pacemaker hack. We had some researchers managing to hack a pacemaker, a real pacemaker, and take control of the pacemaker. And one year later, in 2011, we had the famous insulin pump hack that was presented at Black Hat. Again, researchers at Black Hat presented how you can hack an insulin pump and take control of an insulin pump. So... Again, this got me thinking that maybe Denise was not exaggerating uh, a lot, and uh, maybe there's some kind of truth there. Maybe we will reach a day that we will actually have deaths because of software vulnerabilities. And let's see how this, uh, this went. Let's go a few years later. And uh, five years ago, uh, some hackers managed to uh, get control again of an insulin pump, 
and take advantage, exploit a vulnerability that was uh, left there, and uh, which could lead to potential deaths, which could lead to, to killing the, the person that is actually using that insulin pump. So, uh, you see, at the end of the day, we have reached a stage today that what Denise was saying back in 2010 might actually become true. Uh, so let's, uh, we will be talking a lot about medical devices in this talk. Uh, so let's start with a definition. Let's see what a medical device is. So a standard definition of a medical device, what actually FDA defines as a medical device, is any instrument, machine, contrivance, implant, in vitro re region that's intended to treat, cure, prevent, mitigate, diagnose disease in men. Actually, the definition goes on and on. It has many different categories to include everything. And apart from formal definitions, uh, if I ask you what is a medical device, you'll probably think that it's something like this. So it might be an MRI machine, it might be a catheter uh, taking blood and uh, taking measurements from your body, uh, it might be a personal device that you're wearing and it monitors some health characteristics, an insulin pump, something implanted like, um, you know, like a pacemaker and, and, and so on. So a medical device can be a lot of things. It can actually be just a software application that is getting data from uh, uh, different kinds of medical data and making decisions about the patient, suggesting to the doctor what kind of treatment the patient should receive, what kind of radiation levels should be administered to, to a cancer patient so that he survives. So medical devices nowadays can be a lot, lots of different things, and they can actually be very, very complex. So let's take a look of uh, one medical device that we are dealing with uh, when we do, when we try and help our, our customers achieve FDA compliance. So this is, let's say, a very typical medical device. It has a catheter uh, right there, there on the left, uh, which is the device that actually goes into your blood to take the measurements. Typically, the catheter is connected to a microcontroller that controls what the catheter is doing. And then this microcontroller is connected to the major control unit. The control unit might have different other microcontrollers that take the individual measurements like pressure and so on. There is also a system on module there, uh, which uh, might be running on Windows 10 IoT. It might have even a MySQL database in it, keeping data for a while until they are uh, transmitted further on. Uh, it might have a small hard drive, like a flash drive or something like that. Uh, and this might be a really, really small device, which is uh, right next to the catheter. Uh, so as a patient, you might not realize what this, what this thing is, but again, it's running Windows 10, IoT, it has a database, it has a hard drive, it's, it's actually a very small embedded system. And then this control unit is connected to maybe a, a tablet or a mini PC, which is what the doctor actually controls. So it's a small screen uh, that uh, the doctor attaches and uh, either reads the measurements or decides what kind of drugs will be injected to, to the patient. And as this is a typical computer, again, it might be running Android or Windows, and it has um, uh, an Ethernet port, a USB port, maybe an HDMI port, it's a computer, uh, hard drive, memory, and so on. And then on top of that, this computer might be connected to other networks very typically the hospital network. Medical devices are no longer isolated. They're connected to the hospital network so that patient data can be immediately um, copied to the patient database uh, so that you can uh, invoice the patient later on or you can inform their uh, insurance or uh, do the further data processing and so on. And they may, al may also be connected to the cloud for various reasons uh, or may be connected to uh, the, the company that does uh, maintenance of this device so that they can come in and uh, upgrade those firmwares, upgrade the application, the operating system, and so on. So you, I think you get a pretty good view of how complex a medical device can be and also how much software is running on a medical device. And since you are in uh, OWASP Global AppSec, you, I, I'm sure that you are starting to understand how things can go really, really wrong in this device. So, uh, a bit more history uh, from, uh, from all conferences. Back in two, two, 2010, again, 
David Rice delivered a keynote in OWASP, uh, AppSec USA, and he described uh, the cycle of maturity, is how an industry matures. He took the example of uh, uh, the environmental the sustainability uh, initiative, and he described how from denial we got up to uh, the competitive advantage in the beginning, uh, we used to deny that there is pollution and that this is affecting the environment. And we have reached the stage nowadays that it's considered a competitive advantage to be environmental aware and uh, protect the environment and so on. And kind of the sa David Rice was explaining that the same thing is happening also in ap application security. And uh, let's try and apply this to the medical sector. We started with denial. Again, cost us 2010, listening to Denise and saying that, okay, man, you're exaggerating. These things are never going to happen. But we're way past through denial. We reached regulation really, really fast due to the FDA compliance requirements. I will talk about uh, FDA compliance release uh, in the next few minutes. And we're also past the regulation step. We are, we're actually in the build security in, uh, stage. And I think, in my opinion, very close to achieving a competitive advantage. So let's focus for now on, the, on, the, on regulation and see how uh, the regulatory bodies, mainly FDA, try to enforce and manage to enforce cybersecurity requirements in the medical sector. So it all started in 2005, where FDA introduced guidance for the content of pre-market submissions for software contained in medical devices. In simple terms, FDA created a document which works as requirements on how software should be built for medical devices. Now, this is not cybersecurity yet. We're not talking about cybersecurity. This is not, this is not a cybersecurity requirements document. It's a general software requirements document, but it introduced some really important requirements that have to do also with cybersecurity. First of all, FDA requires you to describe the design of your device, requires to document how the design was implemented. So there's a link between the design and implementation. It makes you think and prove that you implemented the, the way you designed the device. You need to demonstrate how the device was tested and how testing the device verified that the design um, was implemented correctly, in a correct way. And also, very importantly, show that you identified hazards appropriately and managed risks effectively. Lastly, provide traceability to link together design, implementation, testing, and risk management. So this was back in 2005. I think one of the most important concepts here has to do with risk management. Uh, so in 2005, FDA says that if you are going to de develop a medical device, you need to manage your risks. And managing risks means device hazard analysis. That's what FDA calls risk management. Uh, it makes a reference to ISO 14971, which is very popular in the, in the medical sector, in the healthcare sector. So uh, it was evident for uh, medical device manufacturers what they need to do. And um, FDA said at that time that you need to take into account both hardware and software hazards. So it started talking about vulnerabilities or things that may potentially cause patient harm. FDA cares about patient harm, cares about what's going to happen to the patient if something is not working well on the device. So you need to take, you need to understand what the risks are, you need to implement controls, and you need to verify that these controls are implemented correctly. That's what FDA said in 2005, which is pretty advanced. Remember, it's nearly 20 years ago. Also, uh, it introduced the concept of traceability analysis. Uh, the exact text says link together product design requirements, design specifications, and testing requirements. So it made you link design, uh, implementation, and testing, and make sure that there is a, a constant link between those three. We will be talking about traceability later on in much more detail. So fast forward. 2014, FDA introduces uh, cybersecurity requirements, content for pre-market submission for management of cybersecurity in medical devices. So these are requirements that the FDA imposes for the first time, and that things that you need to do before your device goes into market. So you need to do 
these things and submit them to the FDA in order to get approval and so that your medical device can be actually sold in the market. So what uh, this document uh, requires, among other things, and uh, what it says, first of all, medical device security is a shared responsibility. In my opinion, this is a very, very important statement. A medical device is not a standalone device anymore. It's a device that's connected to the hospital network, to the cloud. Uh, it may have, again, VPN connections with uh, uh, maintenance people or those that do operations of the device. So there are a lot of different stakeholders involved here. We have healthcare facilities. A patient may be able to, to use a medical device. We have doctors using the medical device. We have providers, uh, manufacturers of medical device. If something goes wrong, who's responsible for that? So FDA hereby introduces the concept of shared responsibility, and it describes how all these different stakeholders are responsible from their perspective for cybersecurity of the medical device. Again, manufacturers should address cybersecurity during the design and development of the medical device. So you should not just test the device. You should follow a uh, secured by design principle. You should implement it correctly, and then you should test it. Again, hazard analysis, but now in this context, you need to, the FDA says that you need to focus on cybersecurity risk, not just patient harm, but actual cybersecurity vulnerabilities. And then in 2014, FDA, uh, there was an FDA requirement to build a traceability matrix that links cybersecurity controls that you decided need to be there uh, with uh, the risks that were considered. So in the traceability matrix, you had to analyze the cybersecurity risks and then explain what kind of security controls you would be implementing to uh, mitigate those risks. And then at the end of the day, you had to test those controls to make sure that they're effectively uh, implemented. Two years later, FDA introduced another set of requirements. This time, it's called post-market management of cybersecurity in medical devices. And these, these are things that you need to take care of after the device has been shipped into market. So here, FDA talks about uh, monitoring cybersecurity information sources and detecting new vulnerabilities and risks. Uh, you need to create a plan of how you will be uh, addressing cybersecurity vulnerabilities after your device goes into market. Uh, it also explicitly introduces the need to do threat modeling, uh, assess the risk of patient harm. Again, a really important concept. We'll dive deeper into that in a bit. Detect how, explain how you detect and respond to vulnerabilities. And also you need to have a vulnerability disclosure policy and practice. So when you discover a vulnerability in your medical device after it has been shipped into market, you need to inform those that they are affected. You need to tell them what they need to do, if there is a patch to apply, or if there's an, uh, another kind of control that they need to implement. Or if nothing can be done, you still need to inform them, tell them what kind of risk there is, and uh, how soon you expect to have a fix for that. Last year, FDA updated both the pre-market uh, requirements for cybersecurity and also the, the more generic software requirement framework. And uh, uh, it, this uh, update introduced a lot of changes, uh, a lot of important changes, and also brought a bit more structure to the, to the requirements because we have already discussed about three different FDA requirement documents that are slightly overlapping with each other, introducing several requirements that seem identical. So last year's update put some structure in all that. Uh, it introduced the concept of secure product development framework. So now you need to follow something like an SDLC, describe how you build software for medical devices in a secure way, starting from requirements ending to uh, post-market surveillance. Traceability is always there, but uh, now it's, uh, it's expanded. We need to do traceability between the threat model, the risk assessment, SBOM, and testing documentation. Now, this is very, very fresh. It's not clear yet how exactly FDA expects us to do traceability, for example, in the SBOM level, uh, but it shows 
how important it is for the FDA to keep traceability and expand it as much as possible. There are also interoperability considerations, the requirement for SBOM and monitor third-party components. This was uh, expected, actually. And uh, also, it uh, makes a distinction between safety risk assessment and security risk assessment. These are actually two different processes. When you do safety risk assessment on a medical device, you're trying to understand what might go wrong and harm the patient. When you do security risk assessment, you're trying to find vulnerabilities that introduce a security risk. Now, these may seem like two distinct activities, but FDA comes and says that these are not actually completely distinct. One might be affecting the other. So you should conduct both, but you, the one, one activity should actually be used as a feed to the other one. So whatever comes up out of the safety risk assessment as safety risks, these risks should feed your security risk assessment and try to understand what kind of vulnerabilities may lead to the introduction of these risks. So this is what FDA says in a nutshell. Of course, these standards are very extensive. I tried to give a, a short presentation here and uh, highlight some uh, key requirements. It's not just FDA, though. Uh, most uh, medical device manufacturers care about the FDA simply because the American market is the largest one. So any company that's building a medical device wants to sell in the American market. And to do that, you need to be FDA compliant. This is why we care so much about what FDA says. But there are other compliance frameworks. For example, in the EU, we have the EU MDR cybersecurity requirements. This is an EU directive. It looks a lot like the FDA requirements, especially the last year ones. So again, you need to do a risk assessment. You also need to do something called security benefit risk analysis. So for every security control that you introduce, you need to justify what the benefit is. You also need to follow a secure product development framework. You need to do secure by design. You need to have a threat model. You need to do testing, of course. You need to take care of the life cycle aspect, the post-market requirements uh, for cybersecurity of the medical device. And again, we have shared responsibility between the healthcare provider, the integrator, the operator, users, patients, and consumers. So, summing all these requirements up, there are some really important things there. First of all, use a secure product development framework. And uh, another requirement that comes up, uh, it's not explicitly uh, defined, but uh, you can understand it when you're reading the standards, is that the medical device is considered a single entity. We don't have individual elements that uh, work independent of each other. We have a single entity, we call it a medical device. It might be composed, as we saw, from a window, of a Windows PC, uh, an embedded device, and a catheter, but these are not three independent devices. FDA and the EU MDR view this as a single device and instruct you to treat it as a single device. So all elements need to be secure. All elements need to work together in a secure way. And all elements should be tested as a single entity. This may sound straightforward to you, but trust me, they're not straightforward for everyone and in other industries. For example, we do a lot of, we do a lot of work in the automotive industry, and you know how modern cars, cars run a lot of software in them. You have your entertainment system, you have software that controls the brakes, the emergency brake system, and so on. You know how car manufacturers work? They don't build these systems themselves. They buy them from different suppliers. And when they buy them, they view them as individual components. No one actually tests how these components interoperate and how they work with each other. No one tests to see if an existing vulnerability in the system, can affect, in, the, in the entertainment system, can actually affect your brakes. This happens only at the very end, when they test the system. And you all know how this goes. If you don't care about security in the design and implementation phase, and you just do that at the testing phase. So in the automotive industry doesn't see the car as a single device. It still sees it as individual components. But the medical device industry, FDA, uh, tells you that this, I don't care about the individual components. I don't care who supplied you the individual components. This is one medical device, and you're responsible for it, and you need to make sure that it's secure. Another important requirement is shared responsibility. 
When you build a medical device, as a medical device manufacturer, you need to consider the environment where the device will operate. You cannot say to the hospital that buys the device, okay, you take the device, you connect it to your local network, and you have to deal with the security of your local network. I, I don't care what you do with that. My device is secure. I don't care if someone from your local network manages to connect to my device and hack it and take control of it. No, no, it doesn't work this way. You need to provide instructions to your buyer, to the hospital, to the hospital IT guys, what kind of firewalling requirements there are, what kind of risks there are when this device is connected to the hospital network, and what they need to do to ensure that the device is uh, installed and set up in, in a secure way. So you also need to consider if the device is connected to the cloud. You need to also to consider who has access to the device, and you need to take this into account when you're doing threat modeling. Do only doctors have access to the device. Sometimes not even doctors have access to the device, at least direct access. Do patients have access to the device? Of course, if patients have access to the device, this opens up a lot of risks. So these are things that you need to consider when you do threat modeling and when you design your uh, medical device. And uh, also you need to consider how the device is, is updated. Last but not least, one of the key compliance requirements has to do with patient harm. You need to focus on, this is what FDA says, you need to focus on the actual risk. And the actual risk here is that people may die. So you need to focus on patient harm. And this is where it starts becoming harder for us cybersecurity professionals because it makes us think out of the box. So how can we focus on patient harm? How we can quantify patient harm and put it into the, the risk equation. And what we do is actually rather simple. So typically when we do a penetration test or a security assessment, um, we use CVSS, right, to assess if a vulnerability is uh, serious enough or not. So what we do uh, for medical devices is that we combine the CVSS score with what we call the patient harm score. So we have an information system risk score. This is CVSS. It can be critical, high, medium, low, informational. The typical CVSS scoring methodology. And then we multiply this with the severity of patient harm score. This is a patient a score that FDA introduces. Uh, it has five categories, catastrophic, critical, serious, minor, negligible. And you need to add a more specific definition depending on the use of your device. So you need, uh, depending on what your medical device does, you need to um, define what catastrophic means, critical, and so on. So we have two different values here. We multiply them, and we come up with the overall uh, harm risk score. And this is how we take into account the patient harm uh, risk score. And then when we, once we do that, uh, we have the concept of controlled risk and uncontrolled risk. The controlled risk means that we have a low residual risk, uh, things that we can manage that do not result in serious harm. FDA still encourages us to implement additional security controls and do defense in depth, but other than that, it's okay to, to leave it as it is. And then we have uncontrolled risk. This is unacceptable residual risk. You need to implement security controls and mitigations to, to fix this. So a bit of more information of how exactly we do that in census. Again, it's rather simple. We have the classic CVSS scoring system. You know that CVSS has three metric groups base metrics, temporal metric group, and environmental metric group. And then you use these three metric groups to calculate the final CVSS score. So there is actually out there uh, a rubric for applying CVSS to medical devices. It has been developed by MITRE. And uh, this is what we're using to turn CVSS into a more medical device friendly scoring system. So what we actually do, remember that we have the, the, the patient harm severity score. We assign a value next to each of the different scores, like 1 uh, down to 0 0.5. And then we do the calculation. We take only the environmental score out of CVSS because this is what we actually care most about. The environmental score is where you can add uh, characteristics of the actual environment that your system operates in 
and you can modify confidentiality and integrity and availability requirements according to what exactly your, your system does. So we take that, uh, that metric from CVSS, we multiply it by this simple scoring system, and this is how we get the patient harm value. Then we need to agree on a threshold whether the resulting risk is controlled or un uncontrolled. For example, we can say that if the score is more than five, this is an uncontrolled risk, and we need to introduce additional, um, additional mitigations. Of course, this is not a simple uh, decision. We take into account several different things, uh, what kind of device this is. Uh, we discuss this with the medical device manufacturer, and then we agree on a, on a common uh, threshold. And then at the end, uh, the risks that we identify look a bit like this. So the, the information system risk score is a classic CVSS. And what we can see here is that we, we have vulnerabilities that from a pure cybersecurity perspective are quite severe, quite, quite significant. They're up here. They have a high CVSS score or a medium CVSS score. But from a patient harm perspective, they may not be so, so severe, so significant. They may have a, a medium or at least a controlled risk. And this creates quite of an oxymoron. Let me give you an example of what I mean. There are critical security vulnerabilities that have actually, may have actually minor patient harm. So, for example, we may have an, uh, we may discover an actually exploitable vulnerability that allows the attacker to get read access to a database that contains health information. And guess what? This vulnerability may even be a SQL injection vulnerability that gives you access to healthcare data. Is this important from a medical device perspective? It depends. If health information cannot be edited or it cannot be deleted, this vulnerability might actually need, lead to no patient harm risk. You may read healthcare information, but you cannot harm the patient since you cannot change it. And if that's the case, the FDA doesn't care. It's not a significant vulnerability. You don't need to do anything about it. I'm exaggerating a bit here, but it's not far from reality. And of course, some of you may say that, okay, this is, might be true, but we still have personal uh, privacy issues and personal information issues. We might have uh, compli uh, compliance uh, uh, problems with uh, HIPAA or GDPR and so on. So yes, that's true. You may not have problems with FDA compliance, but you might be violating privacy regulations, or you might be not. If you are anonymizing this information, you don't even have a privacy issue there. So this is the way that uh, FDA thinks about cybersecurity. And uh, following, let's uh, talk a bit about traceability and uh, how we do traceability in, uh, in medical device uh, risk management. So actually, traceability requirements are mentioned by FDA in several different documents and guidances. Um, as we saw the last year's uh, requirements say that you need to have traceability between the threat model, the risk assessment, the SBOM, and testing. In another section, FDA talks about traceability of architectural elements to security requirements. And then when FDA describes what you need to put in the architecture view, it says that you need to have traceability of the asset to the SBOM component. It remains to be seen what exactly it's meant by this, but there can be several interpretations. But let's go and see how traceability can work. So traceability starts during risk assessment and hazard analysis. So again, we follow a rather simple approach, but it's really important. We use unique IDs for the threats and risks we identify, and also for security requirements and security controls. So, for example, we do threat modeling and we identify threats like uh, uh, tampering or destroying healthcare information, copy or obtain healthcare information, or another threat might be to, op to obtain valid user credentials. And we use these, these uh, unique IDs. Uh, for example, here we may be doing asset-based threat modeling. So one is an ID for a specific asset, two is the ID for another asset, and then we just use uh, different uh, numbers for the, for the threats. So we have a, identified with a unique ID all these threats, and then we move on. And for each threat, we need to identify security controls. So 
These controls need to be documented in the software requirement specifications documents. Uh, so for every threat, we need to go and describe what kind of security controls we will be implementing. For example, for tampering or destroying healthcare information, we might want to do encrypt encryption of data at rest, restrict access to the database. Same thing for copying or obtaining healthcare information. And for obtaining valid user credentials, we might want to follow uh, and enforce a strong password policy, implement two-factor authentication, uh, implement a time-based login rate limiting mechanism, and follow best practices for secure password storage. Again, we use a, follow a similar method for identifying all these controls, C-1, dash -1, dash -1, dash -2, and so on. And therefore, we have a link between the threats and the controls that we have to implement uh, when we build the device. And then we start the implementation. These controls should be implemented in a way, and we reach the testing phase, where the first thing that we need to do is to assess whether the controls that have been specified are implemented correctly. And then uh, also a penetration test or a vulnerability assessment is required to, and it, it may also reveal additional vulnerabilities so, for example, let's say that we run a security assessment and we identified three vulnerabilities. There is a database management authorization bypass. Uh, there is no password policy enforced, uh, and usernames are actually leaked in application cache data. So these are three vulnerabilities. Again, we use an identification of these vulnerabilities. And what we need to do now is we need to, you know, go assess, first of all, the patient harm for each one of these vulnerabilities in the way that we showed, determine if the risk is controlled or uncontrolled, and then mitigate the risk uh, if it's uncontrolled, or document it if it is controlled. You need to say to your customers that we have, less, we have left these vulnerabilities unfixed, uh, and this is what you need to do to minimize risk. And last but not least, you need to revisit your controls and threat model. You need to go back using the traces that we have left and uh, check to see if uh, you've missed something in your threat modeling process or if one of your controls was not implemented correctly. So summarizing, I think that there are some really important lessons that we have learned. I have learned some really important lessons as a security professional when working with the medical device industry. Products are becoming increasingly complex, not just medical devices, but also cars, consumer electronics, sensor networks. Everything is becoming very complex and very dependent on software. We don't need to focus, we don't have, we don't, we should not focus on individual components. We should try and see everything as a single entity and address cybersecurity risks as a single entity. It's very important to consider the operating environment, who uses the device, where is the device connected to, assume and apply a zero trust architecture, and make sure that you address risks that are, that have to do with, uh, the environment and uh, the users of the device. Don't consider that the users are responsible to maintain the security of the device. Don't assume that the IT operation personnel of your customers will use the device and know about cybersecurity and will set it up in a secure way. You need to provide instructions and uh, relevant documentation on how this needs to be done. Last but not least, traceability. We talked about it a lot and focus on actual risk. Again, us cybersecurity professionals get really, really excited with cool vulnerabilities and cool exploits, but which may be irrelevant for the end product and the users of the end product. It's very easy to introduce a metric like we did with patient harm that's specific to the industry that we are uh, focusing on and uh, give a different perspective on risk. Don't just focus on vulnerabilities, focus on what is actually important for your customers and for the products that you are assessing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kostas. Uh, I think we can open the floor for some questions. If anyone would like to ask a question, uh, you can please come up to the microphone. Thank you. Yeah, the world's complex. Um, I'm interested in the, co the safety and security. I've often seen them seen as very different and silos because safety hates change, security 
which everything's around because the fetch things. What's the method in terms of how systems should be put together in terms of safety and security, given the fact that systems evolve? Yeah, it's, a, it's a hard question to, to answer. And uh, we, we also see that uh, with medical devices because they have a very big lifespan. And uh, for example, you may be using a tablet, an Android tablet right now, which in five years' time will not be, you will not be able to update it and it might have critical vulnerabilities. Um, the, the best way I, I can think of is that you need to take input from the safety guys and try to correlate this with uh, cybersecurity risk. I agree with you, it's very hard to convince safety guys to, uh, to look the other way and uh, consider cybersecurity risk, so it falls more in our hands to, to take into account what they, are, what they have done. And uh, what we often do is we, we take the safety risk management process that manufacturer is using and we try to introduce cybersecurity risk there. If we try to do it the other way around, it usually doesn't work. Yeah. Yes. Hey, um, Costa, great presentation uh, again. Um, two things I want to say. First of all, uh, it seems like you, when you try to evaluate the risk, you multiply it by the second factor of patient harm, which does nothing but just lower the, the first CVSS rate. What if instead of lowering, you have something where it starts with one in the middle and then actually increments it if there is a serious potential for harm, so it actually increments the CVSS severity instead of lowering by default? That, that's just a thought. The, 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 but, you know, I know you're not ready to respond to that. The second comment is, um, how about AI uh, software, right? It, maybe it doesn't have vulnerability, but it still introduces risks to the medical system. So is there any thought of incorporating AI, inherent AI risk into that calculation? Thank you. So to, to answer the first question, I tried to keep it simple in the presentation, so it may not have been evident. The patient harm risk doesn't actually lower the CVSS score. It's a critical factor that affects the entire risk. So we calculate the patient harm risk, and if it's considered to be uncontrolled, we completely ignore the CVSS score, and we say that this is an uncontrolled risk, and we need to fix it. So it doesn't actually lower the CVSS score. It works as a decisive factor of whether you need to address this vulnerability now, or at a later stage, or even not at all. Okay. Um, so about AI risk, uh, to be honest, we are just starting to see it being introduced into the medical device world. Uh, we, in my experience, we have started to deal with software uh, applications that you feed them with a lot of data and then they can make predictions about the treatment or about the, how the, the disease will uh, evolve. Uh, I think it's a, uh, kind of early to address uh, AI risk. I, at least I haven't seen anything in the research field or, or in, the, uh, in the compliance sector. But I think it's, uh, we will definitely have to address it in the near future. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Uh, over here. We have time for just one, one quick question. We have to keep uh, respect um, time. Sure. FDA is actually working on a draft of AI in medical devices, and so you can find that on the FDA website now. Thank you. Uh, I think you can ask one very quick question, uh, and we have to. I'll, I'll be hanging around. If you want to ask me? Yes, yeah, so you can. You can also the rest. You can also ask questions uh, outside. Okay, well, my question, I think it's a very interesting concept that this was a great presentation of vulnerabilities that present patient harm versus not. So when it comes to training on these specific vulnerabilities, do you think it's best to focus first on the vulnerabilities that do cause patient harm and then follow up with the rest of the vulnerabilities, or is it still important to cover the all the vulnerabilities when it comes to yeah, training? Tr tricky question, because uh, you can fall into pitfalls there. If you just focus on being compliant, you need to focus on the vulnerabilities that do patient harm. Uh, but it's not black and white, you know, it's not zero and one. Uh, this is why we use a scoring system that gives you a pretty good idea of what you need to focus on. If you follow the scoring system, you have uh, risk scores 
and different vulnerability severities. So then you can describe in your uh, patching documentation, your patching process, how you deal with vulnerabilities depending on those uh, on, on their severity. So it's not a simple. There's no simple answer to that. It depends. Uh, but uh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, please give another round of applause to Kostas. Thank you.